I hope you never fear those mountains in the distance. Never settle for the path of least resistance. Living might mean taking chances, but they're worth taking. Loving might be a mistake it's worth making. If you don't recognize those lyrics, they are from a blockbuster song recorded many years ago by Liam Womack, and it's called I Hope You Dance. But when you think about these words, they are also a metaphor for something much bigger, something more personal. It is a metaphor for behaving contrary to conventional wisdom and never giving up. And as we consider the careers of people who have had a huge impact on us, many fall into the category of what's called a contrarian. And you know it when you meet them. They are the trailblazers. They are the visionaries who are as likely to be called crazy as brilliant. And contrarian thinking applies to all careers. And if you're willing to take risks and commit, your, commit yourself to a unique vision, you can blaze new trails in business and science, but especially in the arts. And if there is one common thread in the lives and careers of contrarians, it's that they are accustomed to hearing the word no time and again. And anyone who has, has achieved any success has encountered the word no. Which brings us to this evening's guest named Spencer Proffer. He is the first guest on a climb to the top who we have brought back due to popular demand. His first show was met with so much enthusiasm, many asked for a part two. This is a part two. At some point, we'll even have a part three where Spencer will focus on promoting social change in South Africa. But today we are focused on the word no. Spencer Proffer, welcome to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation on 77 WABC. Chuck, I got to tell you, man, I'm very happy to be asked back. I thought that you were more prepared. I've done a few interviews in my journey, and I truly believe you were prepared both socially, culturally, and from a homework standpoint. So I'm very open and happy to be back. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to have you. And for those that don't know Spencer or may not remember from our first show, he's a lot of things, but he is, and I'll summarize as best I can, he's the CEO of a company called Meteor 17. And they're called a Convergence Media Production Company, and he's based in L.A. Spencer produced the first heavy metal record, Quiet Riot's Metal health to reach the top of the part pop charts selling over seven million albums he is the quintessential contrarian and has made a career of turning the word no into yes time and again but most important what spencer does he makes a market where there is none that's what contrarians do and that's what spencer does so spencer tell me i think for our listeners Tell us about the word no from the evolution of your career. Why have you heard it and what have you done about it? Well, I've heard the word no, which is the most commonly used word to any entrepreneur in the music or the media business, because I like to get goosebumps. I like to do things that really ring my bell. And they don't necessarily mean that they're what I'm already seeing or hearing. They're things that I think the public and I want to see and hear. So way back when I introduced Tina Turner into the Tommy movie when she needed to rock even harder, she was fantastic in doing what she did with Ike, but as the acid queen in the Tommy movie, which I had the honor of producing and playing guitar on, I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Many people, including Ike Turner, thought I was nuts. But she was cool. She got it. We did it. It was successful. Quiet riot, laser light shows. I've been, you know, up against the word no most of my career to the current day. Things that I want to do that I think will connect. And you know what? I, I've told my kids time and time again. I have two wonderful boys, Sterling and Morgan. And I told them that Babe Ruth hit the most home runs throughout his career, but he also struck out the most. So the trick is. You want to get up to the plate, swing, be a good batter. If you hit it, great. If you don't, just be ready to bat again. Indeed. It, yet early on in your career, and I think to all of our listeners who have loved your music, 
you have really crossed over and taken unconventional paths when listening audience believe that someone was going to be stuck in their conventions. Why would you do that for an artist when they are often encouraged to keep just doing what you're doing? Well, I've had the good fortune, Chuck, to be uh, and be blessed with working with artists who also have vision. And they may not have always gotten the first record deal or made the first film on their, you know, on their lane. They are in their lane. They may have wanted to be true to their art. And what I like to do is I like to join them as a fellow artist. And I have a big mouth. I have a lot of passion. And my, my gig is to bring their vision to the forefront. And if it's popular, great. If not, my job is to help make it popular. So I happen to team up with people currently and people like John Coltrane, who was a contrarian in his own right, making that documentary and getting Denzel Washington to narrate it, I think was pretty magical. I don't know how many, you know, million and a half dollar documentaries get narrated by a brilliant actor like a Denzel. And things that I'm doing, you know, currently and in the future, all are with people who march to their own beat of their own drum. And that, to me, lights me up because I want to bring their message to the world. And that, I think, is part of the story of your transformation, because I would have to think that each of those projects that you were on, when somebody's telling you to go left, you're going right. What does that word know do to your brain, do your mindset about what you heard that you may believe you have a different idea? Well, the first thing it does is pisses me off because I think I'm right. Otherwise, <laughs> sorry to be so crass about it. <laughs> oh, no, that's fair. I, Listen, dude, I'm a big believer in anything I get involved with. I mean, I'm that way in my relationship with my wonderful wife. I'm that way with my kids, and I'm on I'm that way with my projects. So when somebody says no, I try and see why, and I try and figure out how I can go around it and do it better for the next time I come up to bat with that same, you know, in the same game. So the fact that I get a no doesn't mean that I accept it. It just means that, hey, I got to find another way to go into, you know, live another day. And like the lines from the song you quoted at the beginning of the show, I hope you did. There's a great line that Mark Sanders and Tia Sillers wrote, when one door closes, another one opens. So you close the door on me, I'll find another way to get to the same place. Well, for our listening audience, many of those who are aspiring career climbers in whatever field they may have, they hear the word no, they may not be comfortable in the pivot. What do you do in that pivot? What are your questioning techniques, your outlook? Help them to explain some of the ways that you embrace the word no and try to ch change and inspire the minds of the others who said no. First thing I do is I try and understand why they said no. If there's credence to it, I consider the source. If they're cool, if they get it, then I try and learn from it. If they don't, I just say, you know what, you're lost, and I move on. So if you're a listener and you, you want to go follow your heart and your art and people blow you off, you know what, if you agree with what they've told you, make a change, you know, upgrade. If you don't agree, just move on. But, you know, stay true to why you got involved with whatever it was you got involved with. Is it a song? Is it a documentary? Is it a journey? Is it a book? Anything that's of the arts, any of the great leaders of the world, be it the Richard Bransons, be it the Vince Lombardis, have always gone against adversity and found a way around it. Yeah, I think one of the advantages in, in, in you as a producer of you make something from nothing you had said in our first interview that your life's mission is to give people goosebumps. And that comes from both your music and the other ways that you manifest your art. But when you are producing a song, and I'd like people to relate the metaphor of a song to the words we use, how important is emotion to evoke it in the listener? I think it's totally applicable because when you hear a song, it should move you. When you listen to the great writing of, you know, the Cole Porters all the way through Lennon and McCartney and into, 
you know, modern day poets. I think Ed Sheeran is a brilliant poet. I think Jason Mraz is an artist, you know, personified. And when you listen to their art, it should move you. And if it moves you, it should give you a chill. It should give you a bump here or there. Um, the mission of a producer, be it music, be it film, is to transmit those emotions to the viewing public or to the listening audience. And I would imagine you're dealing with many creative types. There are a few key characteristics that makes you an outstanding producer, but I'd also imagine they cross over to other profession professions. What is it, Spencer, that makes you uh, uh, one that others want to work with? I'm probably because I'm one of them. I don't come from, you know, I've had a couple of corporate jobs in my early uh, journey going through what I've done, but I'm kind of one of them. So if I sat with, when I told Ike Turner that I think that Tina should work on a rock record, I pick up a guitar and I play him the approach. I was one of them working with Lamont Dozier, who's one of the great songwriters of our lifetime. Who's, you know, he wrote all the Supremes, four top hits, co-wrote them, produced them. I've written songs with Lamont. I've been in the studio with Eddie Kramer, one of the best music engineers in the history of music. But if I can be talking, conversant with them in their language, it's not some guy from the outside. I'm actually the guy from the inside bringing it out versus guys coming from the outside in. Not to say that they're not brilliant. I just come at it from a different vantage point. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one because I think when I think about you, you have taken artists and you have, as you did with Quiet Riot, when everybody told you you were crazy, explain what, to, to, to some of our listeners are, are millennials, they may not know Quiet Riot the way some of those who show our age do. Can you explain <laughs> why, why Quiet Riot became such a big seller when everybody told you no way? I think because the music invited an audience to participate. When you are asked to come on, feel the noise, when you're asked to bang your head, it's not just listen passively, you're actually inviting the listener in. And so whether you be a millennial then or now or whenever, inviting an audience to feel part of the, uh, the journey is part of the win. It's not just throwing it at them. It's inviting them to somehow dig it and participate in it. And that's why I think Quiet Riot happened also because there was nothing like it on the radio. And because it was proactive as opposed to very passive music back in the day that that album kicked Thriller out of number one was, you know, great, great music. The police, Duran Duran. But that's the kind of stuff that you would listen to and like just dig it. Quiet Riot, you were being asked to actually get up and, you know, it's like the band Kiss. You know, they want to rock and roll all night and party every day. It's inviting you to participate. And I think that's kind of cool. I hope you dance. I hope you dance. You get up. You, you, you go against the path of least resistance and you do something that, you know, others might not do. So I think inviting an audience to be part of what you're transmitting is, is part of what I think can be can successful, I think, worldwide. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, you are listening to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation on Talk Radio 77 WABC. I'm Chuck Garcia. My guest this evening is Spencer Proffer. Spencer, let me change subjects for just a minute. Because I think for our listening audience, many of them who are going into careers are thinking about it through one channel. I'm this and I'm that. Yet in your career that I think of inspiration, you started as a lawyer, you became a music producer, but most of your work is actually visual and integrates visual and audio. Can you talk about the evolution of how you took one building block to another building block, and then you added another building block, which really counts Meteor 17 as a whole conglomerate, I guess, multi production? Is that a fair word? Well, multi-platform, I think. And if you look at it like if you visualize an oak tree with many solid branches, <clears throat> I actually started as a musician, Chuck, and I worked my way through college at UCLA and law school um, playing in a band and playing guitar. 
but I was never a great artist, and I was blessed to have uh, to be offered a job at the age of 23 to work for Clive Davis, one of the most inspiring, visionary music executives when he was running Columbia Records. So I got my law degree, I passed the bar, I went to work within a corporate context for a couple of years, right. and um, I really kind of paid my dues and learned a lot, Xeroxed a lot, went to a lot of shows, listened a lot, and um, was mentored by Clive and others in a very significant way. These days, I like to do one thing that can beget others. <clears throat> if I make a documentary, having a podcast, I'm building a podcast company with a major Canadian personality uh, broadcaster or best-selling author named Jesse Dillon. Mm -hmm. We're building a company called Inside the Music, where we truly go inside and we talk to leaders who have really made a difference in pop culture. And I think that tees up the interest in the documentary where I want to build stage plays with some Broadway producing power pals I have, uh, Russell Miller and Corey Brunish. Um, we have a book division that um, is kind of inspired by my wife, Judy, who is a journalist and a brilliant author. But we like to make a book based on the essence of the documentary. There's a podcast, there's a stage play. And we just believe, and there could be merchandise that comes out of whatever we create. So I think doing one piece of work with whether it be Eddie Kramer, Lamont Dozier, Steve Bender's Elvis Comeback uh, special that he directed 50 years ago, we're making a doc now on uh, the making of that and his buddy story with Elvis. We're going to have multiple extensions. Steve did a book on that. We're making a documentary. God bless Baz Luhrmann, who wrote the foreword to Steve's book, because Baz is making a feature film with Warner Brothers on Elvis's entire life and journey. So I like the idea of A, feeding B, feeding C, because it's a multi-platform convergence world today. And for anyone who is considering going into the music business, does that mean that they they should be or should consider all, you know, crossing into these other medias? I think music is a seminal and foundational component of all media. You hear music in commercials, you hear music in film, you hear it in television, you hear it on Broadway clearly or in stage plays. So I think that if you're going into the music business, think about how what you create can apply to other mediums in today's world. Here we are in 2020, 2021. It's not a linear path that you go on. You should make sure that anything you create could have multiple applications. And in spite of all of this technology that proliferates, what is it about a hit song, in particular, I'll use the ones out of your body of work, that draw people to it? And, and, and has it changed between the 60s, 70s, and now in, in the 20s? Are there comic don't yeah don't make me that old how about 80s and 90s as well anyway <laughs> the thing yeah. that uh, permeates success I think is repeatability and relatability because if you create a song where the lyrics mean something to you it could mean different things to different people Lucy in the sky could be one kind of story but John Lennon used to write songs that you could apply to different parts of your life the same way McCartney did Great songwriters do that. So I think that the, the success that transcends time is repeatability and relatability. And once you have that, it doesn't matter if you're in the 60s, the 80s, or the year 2090. You know, it's same, same concept. Right. And actually, uh, I, I'd love to hear many people, musicians, ask about influencers. You know, who influenced you along the way? Who, but both today and thinking about how your career evolved, who did you listen to? Well, listen, I love Beethoven and Bach and Handel and Mozart, but I also love Cole Porter. I love show tunes. I love Broadway. I love Muddy Waters. I love, you know, Little <laughs> Richard, who fortunately passed away. I'm, I'm kind of a potpourri mishmash of influences, but, uh, and I've had the good fortune to work in many different forms of music from jazz to rock to metal to, you know, Hopi Dance, which was a country crossover hit. 
But the influencers to me are people who were bold and who actually George Gershwin was a brilliant writer. He and Ira Gershwin wrote some of the great songs that stood the test of time. So I think that Little Richard and uh, even Arthur Alexander, when he wrote You Better Move On, and I heard a John Lennon cover, everything influences everything else. And I think the Stones doing Little Red Rooster are a throwback to the old, you know, stacks, uh, the old blues, the old Chicago blues. I think that the only things that are original is how you take your influences and you mix them up and make them your own. Right. One other thing, Spencer, when I think about it and I've looked at and listened to so much of what you've done, you, you, you've you crossed borders and you seem pretty fluid. In particular, South Africa, either you came into South Africa's life or South Africa came into yours. Can you describe how you crossed a border from America into South Africa and, and what you learned in that journey? Okay, well, I was quarterbacking the music for a dear friend of mine, Jerry Opse, who was the president of production at Showtime in the 90s. And one of the movies that he was very passionate about making was the story of Mandela and de Klerk and Mandela's release from his Robben Island prison. And he got Sidney Poitier and Michael Caine to play Mandela and de Klerk. And I was quarterbacking the music, figuring out how music would play against the visual and the storytelling. And I was convinced after reading the the script that you could not do America's version of South African music. Mm -hmm. And I convinced Jerry and the powers that be at Viacom and at Showtime to let's get a South African composer and make the score in South Africa. And I would go there to kind of ambassador and make sure that it happened, which I did. It was wonderful. We did the score in a treehouse. We mixed it there. We actually put out a record on it. And I got to know the people there. I went to Soweto. I met Mandela through Sidney Poitier. And it was transformative for me because here's a man, Mandela, who stood on his own principles to the point of being in prison for nearly three decades. He came out, he became president of the country, and he was the role model that I really resonated to. So when my John Coltrane film was completed and I wanted to have it really touch the people of that culture, there was a Blue Train, which is the name of one of his most famous albums, and I convinced all the partners that I had to let me premiere that film on the blue train, bring a couple of jazz artists over, jam with some local jazz people, and do a concert at a vineyard, do a concert in Cape Town. And I just became very ingrained in the culture there to the point to where I'm now going to be working on, or will be working on a documentary on how Mandela's anti-apartheid struggle paralleled Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. I'm a big believer in social justice, and there's nobody who personified that more in humanity than Nelson Mandela. And it's very pure to what South Africa is truly about. Indeed. And and we'll go deeper on part two on that one. But what I'd like to examine, you, you had mentioned as you were describing this narrative, that you had to convince your partners and collaborators to you South African musicians, what was their resistance? It just seems so obvious now. Yeah, duh. But they, they must well, have the different. resistance, fiscal, logistic, mm-hmm. and the fact if it's too hard, move on. Go, you know, do something that's a little easier. I kind of, I think because of my upbringing, my, my parents were Auschwitz survivors. We never took the easy road through. So the fact that it was, oh, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Go to South Africa, hire South African musicians, make sure that it works against time code. But that's why I convinced, and Jerry Offset, to his credit, had the vision to say, great idea, do it. So sometimes you get network executives or record company people who kind of get it. They take shorthand. And if you can show them the light, then, you know, his Jerry's production people hated me. Because every time they saw me walk down the hall. hated me. (laughs) Well, they, they thought that this was going to double the budget, which it did. And I said, hey, I ain't going to South Africa. It's 27 hours from L.A. Unless I go first class, you put me up in a suite, but I will show up. I will work 18-hour days. I will deliver this, and it'll be pure. Right. And Jerry got it big time. 
uh, Sidney Poitier got it. His company got it. The people who didn't were the mid-level people who were afraid of the vision and they thought it was too much work. So, and it also cost too much. So you got to be willing to step forward and put your balls on the line like I did with the Coltrane film. I had some vision that I shared with my director. I waived my producer fee in order to put it on the screen. That's what you do if you really believe in what you're doing. Well, that relates right to the beginning of the show for how we open talking about the contrarian mindset, the trailblazer. In the time that we have remaining before we go to part two and we switch off the ABC air, Spencer, we always ask ourselves, what do we want our audience to think, feel, and do? Now, we have covered a lot of think and feel, but for all of those in whatever field they may be who's listening... What do you want them to do with the advice that you are, are discussing as it relates to being a contrarian? What advice would you give them if they were sitting in the room with you? Four words, dare to be great, you know? Don't, you know, if, if, if somebody throws a spitball at you, dodge and find a way to hit it. Uh, bottom line, just believe in what it is you believe in. And if you don't have beliefs, get out of the way and don't do what you're doing. But if you believe in the people and the vision of what the art is, follow the art and you'll follow, follow your heart. You might actually make a lot of money doing that. <laughs> you have listened to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation on Talk Radio 77 WABC. My guest this evening was my friend, Spencer Proffer. Spencer, thank you so much for coming back a second time and joining us on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Chuck. These are tough times and you can either hide or you can try and step forward. And I applaud you for opening the curtain to those of us who really care and want to get something done for the world. Indeed. And to all of the listeners out there, when you get the choice to sit it out or dance, I hope you'll dance. Good night. Spencer, we're going to stop here. We are at 28 minutes and we are heading into part two. So thank you for part one. That was lovely. Was that good? Yeah. yeah I mean, I can't, I can't help myself. I get wound up. <laughs> but you know what? I guess that's part of, that's part of the gig, right? Why would you inhibit who you are? We love you the way you are, which leads us to now we have an opportunity to really talk about some of the projects with some depth. And you have sure. a lot of cool ones. We can't pick all of them, but I would like to start with one where you made a point when we were prepping for the show is that the audience out there of all generations are yearning for all things Elvis. Can you talk about the origin of Elvis bringing him into 2020 and why it matters? Well, to all of our zeitgeist, Elvis was a trailblazer. He just did his thing his way. And a guy very dear to me, who was somewhat of a mentor, Steve Bender, actually had the balls and the vision to get Elvis in the round and to make the 68 comeback special. And Steve and I have been friends for decades. And when the anniversary of that seminal NBC special is coming about, I got together with Steve over some sake and sushi. We decided that, or decided we needed to bring this to the world to the next gen. And we up it, put it in theaters through my relationship with Fathom, which is the event division of AMC Regal Cinemark. We got 227,000 people around the world to come and see it and showed that there was an appetite for all things Elvis. They wanted to kind of see why that was cool then and why it transcended time. Steve went ahead and wrote a book, which we've got coming out next year. And it's a tabletop book about the making of that special that uh, filmmaker Baz Luhrmann has written the foreword to, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to make a documentary on the buddy story of Steve and Elvis. And it is going to bring that moment in time to the next gen or this current gen and future gens. And I think that because you get a guy who is a trailblazer in his day, those trails still blaze today. Indeed. And and what do we want as as everyone tunes into Elvis? What was it about him that made him the king? 
I think he's doing it his way. It's like the lyrics that, that Paul Anka wrote to the Frank Sinatra song, My Way. You know, it's like you just you go down the path that rings your bell. Be it goosebumps or be it dollar signs, it just rings your bell. So the fact that Elvis shook his hips and he sang his licks the way he felt it, and it worked and it connected, that was pure. That's the kind of thing. Yeah, it didn't sound like everything else. It didn't sound like Pat Boone's recordings on the radio, but that's what made it cool. It, yeah, it I, didn't sound like anything else. And, and the reason I ask is I, I have the pleasure of teaching college, uh, and I teach one undergraduate and two graduate classes. So it, it spans some different age groups, and they listen to potentially different things. But what I see often is them the tremendous fear, fear of the unknown, fear of not fitting in, fear of being different. And I understand that. I, it's important people feel like they have a place to fit in. Can you fit in and be the contrarian at the same time? Sure you can. Because like Bob Dylan said it, I'm like a Rolling Stone. When you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. So if you're, <laughs> okay. you know, if you're, if you're coming up, and you don't have much, you got to go for what it is that rings your bell. And if you fit in, sometimes the in will come around you. And if you just try and do what everybody else is doing, you might be successful for the moment, but you're not going to last. If you're doing something that's groundbreaking and it clicks, then that's going to set the tone for the next time you come in, because then people will listen a lot closer. So yeah. I don't know. I can't, I can't help myself. I just, I just go for it whenever I get next to anything. Yeah, well, I think this is uh, inspiring the generation of many of those that face careers, and it may not be in the arts, it could be in finance, particularly a lot of New York sure. finance or in medicine, law, whatever that may be. I think a lot, most don't need to be told what to do. People are good on that. They know how to do things. They know when to do things, but they're often not inspired to do things that are different. And I think, are you conscious of being different, or is it just who you are others follow? Because? Yeah, it's not a conscious thing, Chuck. It's not like I'm conscious, I'm going to do this to be different, mm -hmm. or hey, this is different, so that's why I'm going to do it. I just do it, because that's what I feel. If I'm working with an artist and he has a story and it needs to be told a certain way, then my gig is to get him to tell it that way, or to facilitate that happening. I don't think, well, God, I haven't heard anybody else do it this way. I just do it the way that it's organic to whatever the subject matter is, be it a song, be it a script, be it a book, be it whatever. Um, so I don't think you go into that consciously saying, hey, man, the only way I'm going to be successful is by doing it different. You just do it. And if it happens to be different and it catches, good for you. But I would imagine through all of your projects, and since you cut across multiple mediums and so many different kinds of people, you must have to develop what the social scientists call now the adaptability quotient, the AQ, the ability to understand what we talked about in the word no, the pivots. Were you naturally that way or were you knocked around before you realized, oh my God, I better get adaptable? No, both, but you get you get what's called, you know, you can either bleep this out or use it, but you get a shit shield because you're going to have more shit thrown at you than you can imagine, and you got to deflect it. you got to figure a way around it. So with me, I've had a lot more no's in my career than yeses, but you learn to adapt. You get a no, you, you figure out why, and then you say, you know what, I don't agree with that, or I do, or I'm just going to, I'm going to, you know, go to the side door instead of the front door but I'm going to go through the door. Yeah, indeed. I want to finish or at least spend the next maybe 10 minutes on, on the Coltrane documentary. And he is someone that we looked up to. Anyone who ever heard him knows how different he was. Can you talk about why the Coltrane documentary and, and what was it that Denzel Washington decided was so compelled to come onto the project? Because he was a trailblazer in his own right. He didn't create the riffs and the music he did to be popular. He did it because he felt it. When he wrote Emma, he wrote the syncopation of that to the Martin Luther King speech, the eulogy for the girls who were killed in the bombing in Alabama in 1963 that ignited the civil rights movement. 
Um, he didn't do it because he thought uh, this was going to be the theme for the state of Alabama. He did it because he was moved by Martin Luther King's words, and he wanted to punctuate and decorate them with his music. And that kind of approach to music all throughout his career was what made him great. I resonated to that because he was a pure artist. I wanted to help tell that story. And that's why I think somebody like Denzel and Bill Clinton and Common and Santana and all the people who joined the project joined because they were all marching to the beat of their own drum through their careers. Right. I, I want to change to uh, focus on another artist because I think um, in my own estimation, because I grew up in the world of Motown, I don't think he gets enough credit. When we think about Motown, we think about the Supremes, the Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, and we love their music. But that music didn't necessarily originate from those recording artists. They came from a guy named Lamont Dozier. What, can you tell our audience about Lamont and his extraordinary body of work and, and why you are looking at doing more work with Lamont? Well, Lamont was part of a trio with the Holland brothers, Holland, Dozier Holland. Lamont was an artist and he would actually do demos that became what <laughs> turned out to be the four top hits. Mm -hmm. If you listen to Levi, Levi Stubbs sing, Seven Rooms of Gloom or Sugar Pie Honey Bunch, and you listen to Lamont sing them, it's Lamont's vocal approach. He was an unheralded behind the curtain guy with his partners, Eddie and Brian Holland. And Barry Gordy had them churn out 71 number one songs for the Supremes, Martha and the Vandellas. Right. You know, how sweet it is for Marvin Gaye. Mm. And Lamont and I became social friends because our kids went to school together. And I got to know him 20 some odd years ago. I went to his house, we'd hang out, we'd be dads in common. We sat at the piano, I'd pull up my guitar. We started writing some songs together. So it became a natural evolution that when he wanted to take his book, How Sweet It Is, and tell his story visually, he asked me if I would be the, the producer to make it happen. Not because I was some guy with a lot of clout, but I was a guy from the inside that he trusted to tell his story his way. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'd like to, to focus on one more project, because if when I look at the history of rock and roll, there's another guy behind the scenes that may not get as much credit as I think. We grow up, we grew up listening to Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, and we all love the Beatles and the Stones. But there is an engineer, the guy born in South Africa, I think, and moved to England, and that's Eddie Kramer. What was it about Eddie that made him so important in your world? And are you doing a documentary about him these days? The answer is, I will back into that. Yes, yes, and yes. Eddie yeah. is another visionary guy who is a brilliant talent who transcended any genre. He could work with Hendrix. He could work with John Lennon on All You Need Is Love. He could work with Zeppelin um, and the Stones because Eddie is an artist in his own right. And to tell his story, I've worked in the studio with Eddie. He and I have put our hands on the same mixing board together, me actually watching him because he's truly a master. And we relate musically, and I love the work that he did. So he trusts me to tell his story mm. more so than he would an outsider who may have not been as close to the music as I've been. And I just think nothing but great thoughts about Eddie's talent. Plus, he's a really cool guy. So it, we, we've become friends. I think one common thing, too, is I've become friends with a lot of the people I work with because I relate to them. I'm not just some guy coming in from the outside with a paycheck. We actually team up, and we're partners on stuff. If we make a dollar, we split it. If we lose a dollar, we split it. But we take the journey together. Well, these are love stories. You know, when I look at, at the, the, the people you have worked with over the years, I think it's inspirational for our listeners because I don't think the word collaboration gets enough credit in, the, in, in, in education. You know, and I, I teach my students communication, but when I try to teach collaboration and the importance thereof, that's not always something that comes naturally to them because that's not the way the world, we're, we're raising our children to be that way. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just we need our kids to focus on their studies. Yet you embody this hub among hundreds, maybe thousands of spokes that I just find remarkable. Uh, um, 
you you must in addition to giving people goosebumps you must sleep really well at night well i do my wife knows how to order great sheets and pillows and comforters <laughs> but no seriously i sleep yeah. well because i'm confident in who i am and i really like the people i work with i'm at a place in my life where like I love my wife, I love my children, I love my projects, and I love the people that I work with. And if they're not really solid, ethically, spiritually, talent-wise, I just move on because there are those of the world who are that. And how we find each other, many times it's as lucky as Lamont and I meeting through our children. Having, you know, his daughter Desiree go to school with my son Morgan. They becoming friends, them having a play date, me coming over, getting to know Lamont, his wife Barbara, and actually becoming friends with them. Oh, yeah, we happen to be in a similar business. Oh, yeah, you play piano, I play guitar. Hey, let's jam. And that turned into a friendship that turned into a collaboration. Now it's turned into us being business partners. And what happens, I, I want to examine one other thing that we haven't touched about, and then, and then we'll finish up with any other projects. But I know when I hang around a lot of creative types, God bless them, they stay very much to their knitting. They, they have a vision and they stick to it. Sometimes that leads to incredible disagreements. It doesn't mean they're arguments, but it does mean there are creative differences, which often breaks up bands. How do you deal with those creative differences? Well, I listen to what they have to say. I give them my opinion. But at the end of the day, my job is to bring forward their vision. So I never really get into too much trouble banging my head against theirs because it's really their vision. It's their trip that I need to kind of, it's like they have a bus, they're hiring me to drive it and to make sure it gets to the destination. So I don't generally, I have a point of view. And if I say, hey, you know, this lyric could work better this way or this approach or this dissolve or this whatever, because I come from where they come from, they listen. And if my point of view is cool, they go with it. And if they have a reason that it doesn't work for them, fine, we find something else. But I don't find it. But it has with too many of the people I've worked with throughout my whole career. Once we're together, we are working collaboratively together. But you're also describing your mindset, the mindset of you are working in the service of the success of a mission, an artist, whatever that may be. Do I have that right? Totally. Totally. Because it's not my thing. I'm a failed artist when I worked my way through college and law school. Very humble of you. <laughs> well, yeah, man. I was in a band. I was in actually a bunch of bands. We had four record deals working my way. That's what paid my tuition through college and law school. And every one failed worse than the next. So I came to the conclusion when I was given a chance to work for Clive Davis, that was the end of my artist performing career. And if I could be the guy behind the curtain helping real artists achieve their goals and their dreams, that would be a really good thing for me to do. And that's what I've done for the last 40 years. Yeah, indeed. Well, let's finish up. You know, we've covered a lot of projects here, and it, it, it seems like there's just a lot going on. It, are there any projects that we haven't mentioned? Well, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things we haven't mentioned, but... I'll tell you, the one area that I'm very, very excited about is my collaboration, my new partnership with Corey Brunish and Russell Miller, who are two stage impresarios, Russell being English, having built a lot of theater um, venue uh, ways of bringing uh, stage and theater to people in England, mm -hmm. and Corey having more Tony nominations than I can count on my fingers and toes, much less, I think, three consecutive years of wins next to the Carol King beautiful show come from away company and taking some of the documentaries that I am making and building them into stage plays be the be it regional I don't think they're going to be big bold musicals in the new uh in our new approach to the you know theaters but there's no reason that they can't be dramatized on a smaller scale. And these guys are really hip. They're very cool. They have a lot of vision. And we want to kind of break new ground on the stage, taking some of the content that I create musically and bringing it to that medium. 
Yeah, this even seems full circle. You know, I'm a New Yorker and I watched the Broadway plays and we saw Billy Joel and Green Day and all of these guys and Carole King. It's as if they start on a stage, the music gets airborne, and then that music is so good, it may be a movie, but usually it comes back on a stage. Is, is that a natural progression for successful music and musicians? Well, the lyrics are little stories, and yeah. you can you can visualize them in a very cool way. And those are jukebox musicals. Those are great. But there's also drama that can go behind the making of some of it. So it's not just Billy Joel's story or Carole King's story. Those are fantastic success stories. But there's something intrinsic in the lyrics to some of the writing that a lot of these people have done or the way that Eddie Kramer approached engineering that could be interesting on the stage. So I do think it's full circle. I think everything begets everything else. I think music is visual, it's auditory, it's dramatic, it's emotional, it's inspirational. I just think music is the anchor to life to a large degree. I mean, the anchor to life is air. But if you're looking at in you know, pop culture and media, I think music is at the ground floor of it, which is why I built this podcast company with Jesse Dillon called Inside the Music. I want to talk to people and go inside the creation of A, B, C, and D, be it stage, be it records, be it film, but let's go inside. Right. Well, let me leave our listeners just with some wonderful lyrics. And I think for all of those who are having a tough time through this crisis, this applies to those in good times and in bad. And Spencer, I know you will appreciate these words, but let me close with this. I hope you never lose your sense of wonder. You get your fill to eat, but always keep that hunger. May you never take one single breath for granted. God forbid, forbid love ever leave you empty handed. And Spencer, thank you so much, as always, for coming on to the show for part two, which was the ABC version, and part three. Let's do this again. You got it, Chuck. It's my pleasure. You get it. You ask questions that really light me up. So it's my pleasure to show up. <laughs>